see so many of you this morning. I'll stick that there. In the house of the Lord, we welcome you. And we're going to do part two of the mind of God to the mind of man. So if you'll turn to 1 Corinthians again, please. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Let's just read then from verse 9. But as it is written, I have not seen, nor ear heard, neither hath entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. Notice how we know God only by his own self-revelation. Only by his own self-revelation. He reveals them unto us by his Spirit, for the Spirit searches all things, yea, the deep things of God. Now, you notice how the Spirit of God is God and reveals God to us. And without the Spirit, we cannot know God. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the Spirit of man which is in him. Even so, the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. Now, we have received not the Spirit of the world, Notice that's a small s, not capital S for the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God, which things also we speak not in the words of man's wisdom, which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But he that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, that we may instruct him, but we have the mind of Christ. Let's pray. Father, Will you settle every one of us in your presence? Will you take away every distracting thought from your people? Lord, we now bind every opposing spirit to your word in Jesus' name. And Father, we pray that your Holy Ghost will have free course in this meeting and in all things will lift up the Son of God the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we love you and worship you. And we ask it all in his name and for his glory alone. Amen. We notice in verse 16, who hath known the mind of the Lord? Here's the mind of the Lord. That we may instruct him, but we, that you and I, as blood-washed, blood-bought believers, have the mind of Christ. The mind of Christ is the mind of the Lord. The mind of the Lord that was hidden in him. In other words, his will, his thoughts, his mysteries that were hidden within himself in eternity is only made known to us through his spirit which searcheth those things. In other words, who tells us and reveals them unto us. And when we're saved and blood washed and blood bought, we receive the Holy Ghost and the Holy Spirit. He lives in us. And since we have the Holy Spirit residing in us through the Word of God, He reveals the mind of God to His people. And even as Paul tells us that no man can know the mind of another man, I don't know what you're sitting thinking. Right now, my mind, uh, my mind doesn't know your mind. And you may be sitting thinking, well, I'm looking forward to hearing what God has to say to me this morning. And you're listening intently. Your mind might be thinking of some trouble that you've left at home. Your mind could be thinking of some bad news that you've heard. Your mind could be thinking of what am I going to do, work tomorrow morning on a Monday. And all those things that come upon us, yeah, your mind might be thinking, I wonder what I'm going to do this afternoon. Will I go for a walk or will I have a snooze or or what am I having for my tea or whatever. Your mind can be thinking a million things with all our own thoughts. And I don't know your mind exactly what you're thinking unless you speak it out and tell me. 
And you don't know my mind unless I tell you. And the, the Word of God tells us that we cannot know the mind of God unless he tells us. And he tells us and shows us through his word, this Bible you have in your hand this morning, this is the mind of God to the mind of man, to the mind of woman. This Bible that we hold this morning shows us what God says, what his mind tells us, what his thoughts are. So when you're reading God's word and God's word is a, uh, uh, illuminates and it's the rhema of God's word where it, where it quickens to your heart even especially at times and, and that word becomes a promise to you whether it's a line, a verse, even a chapter that you meditate on and you, you, you turn over and you chew over a, a, and it becomes so rich and real to you that's God's mind to you and Paul tells us that all scripture is given by inspiration of God and the inspiration there means when you open the scriptures the breath of God breathed on you. It means it's breathed out by God. God spoke and breathed out his word. And of course, his word is also himself, for he is God. He was with God and he is God. It's a great mystery how his word manifests in flesh, his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And when we see that, when we look at Christ, we see the full revelation, manifestation, the full mind, the full word, the full will, of the Father when we look at Christ. That's why ministry should always be centered in Christ. That's why our minds should always be fixed in Christ. It should be always centered on the Son for He is the full revelation, the greatest manifestation that the world has ever known of God because He has now taken a body of flesh and revealed Himself to us. And whenever we read this, then the Holy Spirit the Holy Spirit is the mind or the, 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 the person of God who comes and moves among his church to bring the word of God and to explain it to us, to show us it, to strengthen us, to help us. And so the mind of God is in the word and the mind of God is made known through the spirit of God. It starts to get complicated because who can know God that we may instruct him? Who can know his mind and how can we work it out except the Lord show us? But notice this. There's a couple of little things I want to show you before we go a little further. Verse 10 says, But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit, for the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. It's not a philosophy about God. The deep things gives the idea the very mystery, hidden things of God that no man or woman can ever know. And if you start to trust as a believer now, uh, the unsaved will look at it in a moment, cannot know the things of God for they're spiritually bereft of God. But as a believer, you and I can start to read the word and seek his face and be in the closet of prayer and be at the place of worship where the spirit starts to reveal the manif uh, or manifest the, the, the hidden things of God to us. And if you and I think that God has nothing else to show us, and God has nothing else to give us, then we take away uh, the sovereign will of God, not only the sovereign will of God, but we take away or we disbelieve that God is infinite and eternal. God will never, ever be exhausted throughout all eternity because he is eternal and eternity has no end. So we are privileged this morning to have a Bible in our hands. We're privileged this morning to have the Spirit of God in our hearts. And we're privileged this morning that we can see by faith the Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, by the eye of faith, the manifest will of God. Now, when we read here in our reading, notice what it says, for what man knoweth the things of a man, that's what we are speaking of, save the spirit of a man in him, even so the things of God knoweth no man, but the spirit of God. You know the deep things that you hide in your heart and nobody knows but you. And you know the things that you can't reveal from your heart because they're too painful or hurtful or you want to try and forget them. And the things that you can't explain from your heart because you don't know how to put it into words, because it's too dreadful or too traumatic or whatever it's been. You know those things that's been buried for years and years or for such a long time, and you couldn't even put it into words if you want to tell 
someone this morning in private and confidence? Well, those things in your heart that I don't know and your family doesn't know or no one knows, this tells me this morning, his word, God's mind to you this morning is, he says, I know. I know. He knows the depth of it. He knows the hurt of it. He knows everything about it, even the things that you cannot put into words to try and explain it or express it. God says, I know it. I understand it. And then when we go on down here, verse 12 says, Now we have received not the spirit of the world. Praise God for that. The spirit of the world. But the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Now we're seeing what the world has to offer and the spirit of the world. You notice the second letter word for spirit is we have the spirit of God. It really gives the idea that we're speaking of the the God as the the person of the Holy Spirit in our lives is the the capital S. Here it gives the idea of of God's uh, spirit in our nature or in our own spirit quickened. That's why there's a second small s there. Okay, just one in case someone asked me later on about that. But notice what it says here. It says here, We have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. In other words, there are people who don't realize how blessed they are because they don't realize what the spirit of the world is, the dangers that's in the spirit of the world. I walked over the fields yesterday morning with, with Jody. And I talked there about the things of God and where she was in God. And we had a private conversation there. And as we were walking over, I was saying, this is what the world is, Jody, and the spirit of the world. And this is what the spirit of God is. And we were having a good chat for an hour or so, telling her the difference in these things. She says, I know that. And I'm trying to show her more of the things of God. And I says, well, we'll go, we walk further. And as we walked and we talked, I told her what the spirit of the world is like. And she's seen it and it showed her what the Spirit of God will do in our spirits. I'm trusting God will show her more that what she has, that if I had the Spirit of the world and not the Spirit quickened by God and illuminated by Him, then what I was and what I am is two different men. The man you see every day or Sunday or wherever it is, is not the man that I was before I was saved. Nothing like him. (coughs) Nothing like him. An, an, an angry, violent, drunken drug addict. Quick with my hands and I just would have sparked off and violent temper at the drop of a hat and all these sort of things. And I says, that's the spirit of the world. And I held grudges and I made sure I got even. And I've done things I should never have done and I've been in places you'd never have been. And I said, this is the spirit of the world. This is what the world does to you. But God came into my life and quickened my heart to see Christ. So now I realize the difference between the spirit of the world and the spirit of God and a quickened heart glorifying the Lord Jesus Christ. Brother, sister, let me say this. See someone who professes and proclaims the name of Christ and they've no change of life and they have the spirit of the world. They haven't the spirit of God. I'm not talking about people with weakness. I'm not talking about people that struggle at things. I'm not talking about people who fail because we all do. But those who have not the spirit of the world and have the spirit of Christ, they have the mind of Christ, they're changed. They're changed. It's a changed life, a changed lifestyle, a changed heart, a changed walk. 
you're different. And God's still working in me. So bear with me. God's still working in me. And he always will be till his son returns. Here we see how our minds are. God's mind to you this morning is in this word that he knows the hurts, but you got to let them go. A better heart will never spring forth sweet water. I'll pause there. Bitterness and sweetness of water does not pour forth from the same fountain, brothers and sisters. We can be angry and sin not, angry at the right time with the right people, yes. But bitterness and clamor is not of God. It's of the spirit of the word. We must take the mind of God this morning, have the mind of Christ, for this is God's mind to your mind and to mine. Here we have the Lord telling us that he freely gives to us all things. Do you know everything that you possess in a worldly material sense, everything that you possess, it may not be much or it may be a lot, but everything that I possess is all from him. And I've heard, and I've been in front of people, but I tell you, I've worked hard, and, and God bless you, I've worked hard. Nothing wrong with that. And I've worked hard, and I've saved, or I've got, and I've done this, and I've went this, and, and that's okay, and that's fine. Do you see if it wasn't for the Lord that enabled you, you would have nothing. Every good gift Every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variableness and neither shadow of turning. Every penny in your bank account or in your purse or wallet, every stitch of clothing that's upon your back or in your wardrobe, every liter of petrol or diesel that's in your car, every scrape on a shoe leather that's on your foot. Everything is from God. And he give it to you freely. You see, that's called common grace. The man, he gives them gifts. But how we utilize them and what we do with them is two different things. The mind of God comes to the mind of man and to the mind of woman. And he says, I have given you I have blessed you, not with the worldliness, but I've blessed you from my abundance. Notice what he says here in verse 13, which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. (coughs) Notice the natural man. Now we're going into the spiritual realm. And he says, the natural man, the man who's carnal, the man of the flesh, the woman of the flesh, the the unsaved man, the unsaved woman can't understand. Can't understand why they can't get it. They can't see it. And I can't understand at times myself why Christians don't get it and don't see it. The things of the Spirit of God. Because they're leaning to their carnal and to their natural side rather than opening themselves in their mind to the mind of God for them. Now notice this. But he that is spiritual judgeth all things, and for he himself is judged of no man. But who hath known the mind of the Lord, that we may instruct him, but we have the mind of Christ. We looked last week at how the mind can be instrumental to be helpful. It can be detrimental to be hurtful or harmful. It can be sentimental, that is, on our emotions, on our feelings. And nostalgia can be very, very dangerous because sometimes, especially if you have been uh, in the world and you've been uh, uh, having those times that have been seemingly good fun, 
doing your, what you do in the world, and you can hear a certain track on a record or a tune or, or a certain smell, or a waft of a pub as you walk past, it can bring nostalgia in when you had a laugh. And all you hear is the good things that you remember, for there's pleasure in sin. And the mind doesn't have the mind of God, and that nostalgia brings you into a place where you find that you are now sitting with the spirit of the world among the world. God did not give you the spirit of God and quicken your spirit to sit among the world with their spirit. All it takes is one nostalgic thought and you start to reminisce. And you start to think about out with the boys or the girls. We had a good time and next thing the old tempter comes and says, do you remember that wasn't a laugh? We don't like to do that again. Next thing you know, you're sitting with them having a Coke, a shandy, a pint, a vodka, spirits, and you're gone. Nostalgia can be very dangerous. Watch out for nostalgia. But what it doesn't show you, nostalgia never shows you the bad times. It never shows you when you were sick with it. Never shows you when your pocket was empty with it. Never shows you when a marriage was nearly ruined by it. It never shows you when the hurt came to your family and your children with it. Nostalgia is very dangerous. So the mind of God and the mind of man and woman must be, well, what is the Spirit of God saying according to his mind and his word? It's his word. And this is our defense against all temptations. That's just an example. And then, of course, there's judgmental. Judgmental thoughts are the moral or personal thoughts where a man or woman looks at another and may say out of a wrong heart, without taking the beam out of their own, they look at a speck in someone else's and they say, see him, see her. Let's be careful. We looked at the word repent, which means to change your mind and your heart, remember? Meta means after uh, and applies change. Noeo means to perceive. So when you perceive the word, your mind changes. When your mind changes, your heart changes. When you fill your heart with the word of God, your mind will follow as well. And it works together. And that's repent. And the Christian needs to always keep their mind and focus with the word of God. Turn with me, please, to Philippians chapter 4. I want to round up on this this morning. Philippians chapter 4. We mentioned this last week, but I want to go a little further with it, just as finishing scriptures, really. Philippians chapter 4, and let's just read, and I'm going to stop, start, just to break this down for you. And I want you to see the mind of God and what God wants you to do when you're feeling low, you're down, you're struggling. Whatever way, I could give you a million examples. And maybe you're feeling one way or another, or thinking something, or you feel condemned, or you feel whatever. Let the mind of God come to your mind this morning through his word. His word is his mind. So let his spirit work on our minds this morning and then let it drop into your heart. Verse six says, be careful for nothing. Do you see the term there, be careful for nothing? It doesn't mean you've been careless. That's not what it means. It gives the idea that the Philippian believers were worried all the time. I mean, they were stressed to the max all the time. Worried out of their own skin about every little thing all the time. And this, was a, this seemed to be a persona of this church. Many of it were just worried, 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 worried. And Paul comes to near the end of this epistle that he writes in this letter, and he says, be careful for nothing. And it gives the idea, you are habitually worrying anxiously for nothing. So we have habitual worry. Write it down. This is habitual worry. Now, we're going to look at what Paul says about this. Be careful for nothing. But in everything, how many things? In everything. Everything that you're worried about, everything that comes to your mind, everything that's dragging you down, everything that's causing you to feel depressed, 
everything that's tempting you, everything that's trying you, everything that's stressing you out, in everything, he says. Notice what is the remedy, but in everything, one, by prayer. By prayer. See the word there for prayer? It, it gives the idea of um, a prayer of worship. You know what Paul's saying? In everything that comes against you, go to a place of prayer. Go to a prayer meeting or go into your closet and pray, but worship in your prayer. But Lord, I don't think I can worship today. Worship me, he says. But Lord, I don't know how to worship, he says. Worship me. Let your heart worship him. The word here for prayer isn't just bless us for no more, call us the chosen frozen, now open the door and go. That's not what it is here. The idea is you go before the Lord and you start to worship him. Let me give you an example. Lord, you're great. And you're greatly to be praised. Father, there is no one like you. There's nothing too hard for you nor too difficult for you. You are the one true living God, the great eternal spirit, the great I am, the ancient of days. Lord, I come to you because you alone are able, you alone are worthy. You can do exceeding abundantly above all I could ever ask or think of you, Lord, since I come to you this morning for, Lord, in my weakness, you're strong. And you start to praise him. How great you are. You have flung the stars into their orbit, and you uphold all things by the word of your power. Oh Lord, there's none that is beside thee. There's none like unto thee. And Lord, even when you ask us, is there anything too hard for me? We say, no, Lord, there's nothing too hard for you. And Lord, we worship and adore you. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. You worship him. Just worship him. Just worship him. That's the idea of this prayer here. Go before him and just worship. You know, we usually go open the door and we get this spiritual shopping list out. Lord, will you bless granny and granda and auntie and uncle and auntie Aggie sore toes stubbed at the end of the bed and all that sort of stuff, you know. Amen, it's real. It's not prayer. It's not prayer. That's ritual. Stand in his presence. Know where you are before him. And worship worship him. Notice this. But in everything by prayer, come and worship him on supplication. Now, the words here for supplication means now bring your own personal need. Lord, you know I'm praying for this one. You know the sickness of my loved one. You know, Lord, what we have need of. And Lord, I'm bringing this trouble to you. This happening or that's happening or this boss and work. And you're bringing, that's the supplication because you've worshipped him. Do you see when my children are looking for something? You know what the first thing they do to me? And I know what they're at. Daddy, do you love me? Sure you know I love you. What do you love me? You know how much I love you. Could I go to, <laughs> could I have? And they get around me, I would say almost every time. And what we're doing is saying, Lord, you're wonderful. I can't. You can't. I don't know how to, but you do. Because you're great. Because you're mighty. Because there's none else. It's only you. There's none like you. And so then we bring our supplications. Look, look, with thanksgiving. So now we're believing he's going to answer. Lord, you know this problem, this circumstance in my family, and I'm bringing it to you, and you've told him how great and wonderful he is. Now you're going, thank you, Lord, that you're hearing me. Thank you, Lord, that you're answering me. And Lord, I'm leaving it at your feet, and I'm walking away. And leaving it there. Brother, sister, that's the mind of God to the mind of man for you this morning. The mind of woman. That's what his word tells us. So we must take his mind and repent. What is it? When we hear, it means afterwards, after perceiving what God is saying, we turn around. 
we change our mind away from the fear and the worry and anxiety. We change ourselves around to say, well, this is what you say, so I'm following hard after you, then I'll trust you. And then notice what it says here. In supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. See in the, see in the original Greek, it, the terms unto God, and I want to open this up for a second. It gives a little, it, it's stronger than just coming unto God. You know what it is? It gives the idea of make your request known in his wonderful presence. That's where it goes. Or in his glorious presence. In other words, know when you're in your closet or when you shut your bedroom door or when you're in a meeting here and you're praying or wherever you are, over a field or wherever you do, that he is omnipresent. And you, although his presence surrounds us all everywhere we are, but once we turn ourselves to him, he's always there. Once we turn and fix our mind to his once we turn and fix our hearts to him, once we turn around to communicate with him, he's always there. He's always watching. He's always waiting. And as soon as you turn, he's there. He hasn't went away. You realize. It's like me walking beside you everywhere you go and you're, you don't know I'm there. And suddenly you turn around and say, oh, there you are. That's the idea of it. And you realize I'm in your presence, even though a situation is going on around me. I'm in your presence even though this hardship has come upon me. I'm in your presence even though I'm praying and my prayers uh, feel like they're bouncing off the ceiling and falling back on my own head, that the heavens feel like brass. And, and, and I'm still in your presence, he says, yes, because it's not how you feel. He says, it's who I am. It's not how you feel, even when you're at your lowest, even at your weakest, even at your worst. It's not how you feel. It's who he is. See right now. He's in here. Right now. You know what the problem is? God's people don't recognize it. Many of them. He's here. And it's for us to say you are here. At all times. Now notice verse 7. And the peace of God, here's your troubles. Now what are we doing? We have worshipped, we have supplicated, or we have brought him our request. Now we have thanked him for hearing us because we're in his presence. We have acknowledged it. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Notice the peace of God. There's peace with God and there's peace off God. Every one of you who have made that calling in your election sure in Christ and are saved by sovereign grace, trusting in the full merit and the power of the blood of Jesus and sacrifice on the cross and sealed and filled with the Holy Ghost. Every one of you who are and have, have made your peace, listen, with God. You're reconciled to God in Christ. You've made your peace with God, but many have not the peace of God. Many have not the peace of God. The peace of God is Christ in your storm. The peace of God is when you're fully at rest and knowing whom he is and who you are in him. And that he's here with you. And your mind has, re has received his mind, as it were, his word. So there's a difference with the peace, and peace with God, peace of God. And the apostle says, and the peace of God, uh, that communion and fellowship brings the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, which others can't even give to you, which Jesus says the world can't give to you. Peace I leave with you, my peace give I unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid, he says. And that peace which brings you through the most horrific sort of times in our lives and the most mournful and hurting times in our life, yet there's something inside us when others are falling apart that says, I'm with you, keep going. I'm here, I'm for you. I'm not against you. 
And the peace of God which passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds. And the idea of a keep there is that he puts a, a century soldier. It's like a soldier standing at Buckingham Palace there, you know, the, 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 with the red coats on. It, it's like a, a guard. It's like someone who'll stand watch. In other words, the peace of God will stand watch over your mind and over your heart. Notice the mind and the heart, the mind and the heart. Remember, change of mind is a change of heart is repentance. It's the mind and the heart. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are good or are, are of a good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think, set your mind. Think on these things. Listen, brothers and sisters, do you see if you're in company of people who are always negative, it's going to infiltrate your mind and it'll fall into your own heart. Do you see if you're in the company and spending time with people and you fellowship with people who are always gossips, you'll become a gossip. Do you see if you're in the company of someone who's worldly, you'll become worldly. If you're always in the company of someone who has anger and clamor and bitterness and strife about them, you know what happens? It rubs off on you and you become like them. But when you start gathering yourself into godly company and those who will love the Lord and those who want to be in his house and those who want to go to a place of prayer and those who want to sing his praise and those who think and say, you know, we, we look for the good in people and we look for, for forgiveness and we, we don't want to walk in anything that's contrary to the word of God, you'll be like them. You'll be like them. And Paul says we must set our minds in these things for this is God's mind to you. Now, when we get the first nine, he says, those things which we have both learned and received and heard, and which ye have both learned, received and heard, and seen in me, he says, do. Because Paul's going to show us now as we close this, he's going to say, look, notice how I get through. And Paul talks about the, uh, uh, he talks about uh, in other places of, of the, the imprisonment, the, the, 40, uh, the, the, the whippings of the Jews. He talks about the, the, the shipwrecks. He talks about being stoned. He, he talks about all of this and how he's been, been poor and then he's had a bit more uh, money or he's had a bit more goods and, and he knows what to do with all this in these circumstances. And Paul says, see how you see me. He says, if you do this, he says, you'll get through because this is the mind of God. This is the mind of the Lord, now the mind of Christ in you. Notice this. He says, those things which you have heard, those things which you have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do, and the God of peace shall be with you. The idea here is, remember, it's habitually worry. Now write habitually practice. The idea here is he's saying, if you habitually practice the word of God, which you have seen me do, you'll have the God of peace in and with you. But I rejoice in the Lord greatly now at the last of your care of me. I flourished again wherein you were also careful, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in respect of want. Notice this. Paul's saying, I'm not needing anything. For I have learned. Now Paul's talking what he's learned. I have learned in whatsoever state I am though therewith to be content. See the term I have learned. You know what it means? I have learned to enter into a new condition. Now you need to get this. Because some of you, and the, the birds fly around the head and they build their nest there. And next thing you know, your mind's all over the place and your head's all over the place and you're in a flurry and you don't know whether it's Monday, Tuesday, Friday or Saturday or what day it is. And you don't know whether it's morning, noon or night. You don't know where you're coming or going. You know why you're up or down, blew up or stuffed, punched or bored. You need to learn to enter into a new condition. And how do we do that? It's the mind of God and his word to the mind of man, to the mind of woman. Paul says, I have learned to enter into a new condition. And what is it? Notice this. In whatsoever state in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. 
Now, for you and I to say, right, I'm going to be content and sit here in a stupor. I'm going to sit here and do nothing. That's not what he means. The term here for content means I have learned, I've entered into a new condition that whatsoever state I find myself in, I become the master of it. I become the master of it. If life throws you lemons, make lemonade, in other words. Become the master of where you are. Become the master of the situation you're in. Change your mind. I'm, fi- I'm, I'm fearful. The Lord says he hath not given you the spirit of fear, but of power of love and of a sound mind. You need to take that. It's the mind of God to the mind of man, the mind of you, mind of woman. Oh, I, I feel alone. The Lord says, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. That's God's mind to you. You need to believe it. Even when you can't feel it, remember, he's always there. Whatever it may be, I'm feeling that I am very down and low. What does the Lord's word say? He is the lifter up of mine head. Lord, you lift my head up, the mind of God to the mind of man, to the mind of woman. The Lord is the strength of my life when I'm feeling weak. Lord, you're my strength. I feel weak, but you're my strength. I'm going to go on. I'm going to make it. You're coming through for me. And it's taking the mind of God to the mind of man, the mind of woman. God has given us his mind for us. Then Paul says, be the master of it through the mind of God to you and I. I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound. I am everywhere in all things. I am instructed to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. Do you know what it means? He says, I've learned to be independent of external circumstances. Do you know happiness depends on your circumstances? Happiness, hap means chance. That's what it means. On Whenever chance happens in your life, if something happens and it makes you happy, but that's not the peace of God. That's not the peace of God. If you're and I, if we are dependent on our circumstances, then we are going to be up and down every day. We're never going to get through. We're never going to make it. But when we have the peace of God because his mind is now in the mind of us, his word is residing in us, then when those times come, we become content or the master of that situation. And when we become the master of that situation, then you and I find, as Paul says here, that he has learned to enter into a new condition and he becomes independent of all the external circumstances circumstances. It doesn't matter what they say. It doesn't matter what they say. You get down because someone says something about you. Listen, brothers and sisters, see if I told you what people said about me. See if I told you what I hear, what people say about me. You wouldn't, you wouldn't want to leave the house sometimes. See, when you're in a public arena, you wouldn't want to leave the house. But I'll stand and I'll fall before the Savior. You can't allow your circumstances to determine your peace. You can't allow them to determine your peace. You can't allow what a man does to you or what a woman says about you or anything or vice versa or the circumstances that come against you to determine the peace of the mind of God given to you in his word because that mind will override all things and carry you on. And you be assured when you step out to do something for God, the old devil won't like it. You go into his backyard, he'll attack you. Timmy Wright's giving his testimony next Sunday night. Pray for him because you're going to need it too. Don't like to scare you before you come up with a bunch of sandling. But that's true. It's true. And when you get up to testify or you get up to speak, you're automatically a target on your back. You're automatically, well, here's what I think and here's what he said and here's what this one, X, Y, Z. Listen, Don't let circumstances determine your peace. But let the word of God, the word of Christ, dwell richly in your heart. With the mind of the Lord, we have the mind of Christ. 
I could go on and up, but I'll see, I'll maybe just not do another one next week. I'll see how I get on because of other things I want to bring to you. But here's what the Lord says to you this morning. My thoughts are not your thoughts, saith the Lord. I'm thinking like this about myself. He says, well, I don't think like that of you. I love you. I love you. He's way higher than us. God bless his word to us this morning. You know, your attention has been tremendous and your attendance has been encouraging.